Hey everyone, in this video, I'm going to show you how to integrate Firebase authentication with your Next.js application. As a side note, I have another video showing you how to integrate Firebase authentication with a standalone React application and Express for your server, all in a monorepo. So there we use React, Next.js and Prisma. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check it out. So let's start. For this, I'm going to show you some sequence diagrams so that we can get a better picture of how the whole process will be. So the first step is the user opens the application. Now, if they are not authenticated, they will be presented with a login button. And when they click that login button, the React application will open up the provider via Firebase. So for example, we could use the Google provider. And so the user will be prompted for their email or an account in Google if they are already logged in into one. And once they complete that process, which could be in a pop-up, for example, our base will return to the client the access token. Now, at that point, we're technically authenticated, but now we need to let our server know. So for that, we can send a login post request to our server, which would be Next.js, and it receives that access token. And then with that access token, we create a session token in Firebase. So the whole authentication is being handled by the Firebase service. Now, once we have created the session token, we can find or create the user in our own database. That way we're persisting everything in our database and we're just using Firebase as the authentication service, nothing more. So once we have found or created this user, we set the session token as an HTTP only cookie and return the user information. Now this part is crucial, an HTTP only cookie cannot be accessed by the client and by default, it will be sent for every single request. So no one with a malicious intent can try to access that cookie. And we get the benefit of for every single request, it is going to send that cookie so we can validate the session. Now, aside from setting the HTTP only cookie, we also return the user information. That way, our application can store the user info in memory using something like Sustand, or you could use context for this. So as we can see, we're delegating all of the authentication to Firebase, simplifying the authentication substantially. Now, what about a returning user? That is when they are authenticated and they visit the website again. Well, for that, when they open the application, they'll have that session token in a cookie. Now the React application, in this case Next.js, will perform a me get request with the session token. Now the server will take that session cookie and validate with Firebase. And if it's valid, then we get the information in the database for that particular user. And then we return that user information to the client. And again, we store the user information with Sustand. And at this point, the user has successfully authenticated. And so with this information, we can now show the logout button as well as the user information. Now for this, I'll be using the T3 stack, which is simply going to scaffold my Next.js application. So I'm going to say pmpm create and then T3 dash app at latest. Now I'll call this Next.js Firebase demo. I'll be using TypeScript. Let's say we're going to be using Tailwind, although for this project, we do not care about styles. We will be using TRPC, no authentication provider, pretty self-explanatory. And for the database URM, I'll be using Kisily, so we can skip this. And yes, we're going to be using the app router. And I'll skip Git for now, although you'll find the repository in the description. And let's also skip pmpm install. Although you can do it, but for my case, I need to configure something for pmpm before. Now for import alias, just the add sign. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is create a file dot npm rc. And then here I'll say no linker is equal to hoisted. 
and this is because PMPM doesn't work that well with WSL, which is Windows Subsystem for Linux, with WebStorm, which is the ID that I'm using, and that is because PMPM uses symlinks, and for some reason WebStorm doesn't support them. So if you have this problem, you can do this as well, but I believe most of you are going to be using VS Code, so you can skip this. And if you're using Linux, you're not going to get this bug. Now I can come here and say PMPM install. Now let's see if the application works, which it should work. So I'll run this in dev mode. And as we can see, it is working. So if I submit something via the server, and if I take a look at the console, we get this input. So now we can start configuring the project. So first things first is configuring the database driver. I'm not going to be using an ORM per se, but rather a query builder that has full type safe support. And that is with Kisali, a type safe SQL query builder for TypeScript. As we can see, it is pretty much SQL but typed. And since it is SQL but typed, the performance hit is minimal compared to an actual ORM like Prisma. So for that, I'm going to install pmpm add kisily. And after that, I'll add the code generation so that we can generate the types from our database schema. So I'll say pmpm add and then dash d, so as a dev dependency, and then kisily code gen with a dash. And after doing that, come here to the package.json and add these two scripts. So we have db codegen, which is going to generate the TypeScript types from the database. In this case, we're going to be using Postgres and then db codegen and verify so that we can run this command and see if the types are synchronized with the database schema. I'll also come here over to the prettier configuration and I'm going to add another plugin, which is going to be prettier plugin and then SQL and then prettier plugin embed. That way, if you write raw SQL, it is going to format it using prettier. But for this, we obviously need these plugins. So we can say yarn add, then dash d, and then prettier plugin embed, and prettier plugin SQL. And it's actually pmpm, not yarn. And we should be good to go. Now let's configure the database. So I'll come here to server and create a file called database.cs. And here I'll just copy and paste this. Now this is going to set up Kisily so that we can say db dot select from etc. It is going to configure the dialect to use the Postgres dialect. So we pass in the connection string which comes from the database URL. And then here, if the environment is set to development, then we're going to log to the console the queries so that we can see what is going on under the hood. And if it's production, then it is going to be undefined. So do not log anything. Now you can copy this file, you can find the repository in the description. Now, as you can see, we have an error here, cannot find module PG. So what I'm going to do is say yarn or pmpm add PG. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, we also need the file, the TypeScript declaration files. So for that, we can say pmpm add dash D, then add types and then PG. And as we can see, it is now configured. Now I'm getting an error here. So I believe I need to restart my Eslin service. And with this, the error went away. Now the T3 stack scaffolded this project with an environment variable runtime validator. So that's why here we use env.nodeenv. So for that, let's do the same for the connection string. So we can come here and we can say on the server database URL and then z.string. And then we need to add this to the runtime env. So database URL, and then we can say env.database URL. Now again, another wrestling error. So let me restart this service once again. 
So now what we need to do is set up the Docker Compose for our Postgres database. And that is for testing it locally. So I'm going to create a file, docker-compose.yaml. And here, what I'm going to do is just use GitHub Copilot Chat. So create me a docker compose.yaml for a Postgres database. It should not restart. Set to no. That way, if you open up Docker Desktop, it is not going to run the container automatically. The user and pass should be the same. And I'll say name it Firebase. And the database name should be Firebase2. Expose the same port to the host machine. And with this, all I need to do is copy this and paste it here. We should also name the container. So container name should be Firebase Auth. So now with this, we can come here to the .m file and we can say database URL is equal to and then Postgres and then Firebase and then the password is Firebase at localhost 5432 and then the name of the database is Firebase2 and let's just say nodeenv is equal to development and we should do the same for the example. So anyone who clones this repo can just copy it over to the .m file and start the application right away. Now I forgot to mention, and that is with this Docker Compose, you're not going to get your data stored for subsequent container restarts. That means that if you restart your container, everything will be lost. So for that, you could add a volumes. So you could say volumes, and then you can add an init SQL. If you want to configure something beforehand, maybe some tables, but this is not necessary. But you can add a DB data and then you point to the PostgreSQL data in the container. That way you can then say volumes and you have it for the DB data. That way if you restart your container, the data will not be lost. Now with this, all we need to do is say docker compose app dash D, so detached mode. Do not take up the current terminal process. And as we can see, it created the container. Now let's actually get rid of this directory. So we need that SQL. We do not need that, nor this volume. Now what I like to do for the migrations is to use Prisma because it is very intuitive and it has great documentation for migrations. Of course, you can use whatever you want here. So I'll come here to my terminal and I'll say pmpm add dash d and then prisma. And then I'll say pmpm dlx and then prisma init. And as we can see, it created this prisma directory with the schema.prisma file. Here we can say model user id string, then add id, so primary key then default IUID, then create a add, date time, we can say default now, we can map this to create a add, and we can say db dot timestamp tc, so time zone, and then update a add, we can do the same, so this is actually update a add, and then we can say name, string, this is optional, then email, this is a string and unique, and then the image source or image URL. And this is optional, but a string too. And then we can say add index and we want to add an index for the email. And then we can map this whole table to be users. Now with this, we can say Prisma DB push. And this is going to apply the schema to the database. So as we can see, we have your database is now in sync with your Prisma schema. Now we generated the Prisma client, so we can import it from at Prisma slash client. However, this is not what we want since we're going to be using Kisily. So we do not need the Prisma schema. All we need is the Prisma CLI. So for that next time, what you can do is run this flag dash dash skip dash generate. 
However, for this sample project, it doesn't really matter. Now we need to create the migration. So for that, we can say Prisma, then migrate, and then dev dash dash name. And then we can say add user stable. And then we can say why. And as we can see, it created this migrations directory. And we have our first migration. As we can see, we have create table users, then ID text not null, then created add, then updated add name, email, image URL, then it added the constraint for the primary key, and then it created the two indexes. So this one, so that the email is unique, and then the actual index for performance reasons. However, there's something important to consider, and that is if I come here to the schema, we have this at updated ad. Unfortunately, this is not going to work for us since we're using Kisily. Now this works with Prisma if you use the Prisma client, because the engine of Prisma will well identify that it has the at updated ad, and every time you update a user, it is going to automatically update this column as well. But since we're using Kisily, this does not do anything whatsoever. And we can confirm this here. There is nothing that states that the updated ad column will be automatically updated. So what can we do in that case? Well, for this, what I would do is first of all, get rid of this migration. It doesn't work. So what we can do instead is say Prisma migrate dev. We pass in the name and then we can say create only. So it is only going to create the migration, but not actually applied. And if we do this, we can say yes, get rid of everything. And we can come here and now edit it. And to apply it later on, we can say Prisma migrate dev. So here, what we can do is create a trigger function. And that is actually the most common way to do this in PostgreSQL. So after all of this, we can say, and I'll say trigger function. And all it's going to do is take the row and then assign the updated ad to now. And then we can create the actual trigger that before you update a user row or multiple rows within a single transaction, you simply go over each row and you execute this procedure. So just invoke this and this is going to go one by one and update the updated ad. Now for any new tables that you're going to add, you can skip this since it has already been created. So you can just create this trigger. Or if you take a look at this, we have create or replace the function. So in that case, you could theoretically just copy this and it will always exist. But for that, just use this and you specify the table name and then the name of the trigger. So if you had a product, then you'd say update products updated ad and then before update on products and then you invoke this trigger. So with this, we can now apply this migration. We can say Prisma migrate dev. And as we can see, it has successfully applied this migration. Now we need to generate the types for Kisily. So for that, we can come here to the package.json. And first of all, what happens if we run this one? So verify if we do this, we get a generated types are not up to date. So we can now run this and it says introspected to tables and generated the types. So now we can come here, for example, and say the B select from, and then we get users and also Prisma migrations. And then we can say select, and then we can get the ID and then aware, etc. Because we can see everything is fully type safe. Now, the last thing we need to configure regarding the database is to add it to TRPC's context. So we can come here to the server directory on the resource, and then we can come here to API and then TRPC. And here, what we can do is say DB, and we can import this from this file where we declare the Kisily driver. And then with this, we can come here to the routers, then the post router. And then we can access the context and we can say context dot and we get access to the B. So now that we have successfully configured our project, let's move on to the Firebase configuration. 
So let's start with creating the Firebase project. So come here to the console.firebase.google.com and then we're going to click on this add a project. Now let's say this will be test project and then continue and I'll disable this. So once you have the project created, we can now continue and we're going to come here over to project settings and come here to your applications. And this is going to be a web application. So this will be web app and then we register the application. And now you need to store this Firebase configuration somewhere. So I'm just going to copy it and paste it over to my notepad. Once you have this, we can continue to the console. Now let's come here to the left panel. Let's come over to all products and then authentication. Now here, let's click on get started. Once we have this, we'll keep this simple. So only Google for now. And let's enable this and then we can save this. So once we have this enabled, we can come here to project settings and then service accounts. Make sure you're Node.js and then we can generate a new private key. So let's click on generate key and this will download a file with all of the keys. Okay, so once you have that, what we're going to do is add a dependency, pmpm, add and then Firebase. And this is the SDK for our front end so that when the user clicks on the login button, we can open up that pop-up with the Google provider. And then Firebase can give the client the access token. So once you have this dependency, we can come here to the source and create a lib directory. And here let's create a configs directory. And within this directory, we can create a firebase-config.cs file. Now here, what we need to do is say export const firebase app, which is equal to then get apps. And we import this from at firebase slash app and we invoke this and then we access the length and we check is this greater than zero. If it is, then just get apps or rather get up. And this is going to give us one application, which is the one that we're just configuring. As we can see, the default application is returned. Otherwise, we can say initialize app and we import this from add Firebase app as well. And we can pass in some configuration here. Now, the reason we're checking this is because you can have multiple applications. But in our case, we only need one and that is for the Firebase authentication. So this is a way to have a singleton. So we check is there an app? If there is, just get the default application. If there isn't, create one, which is pretty much the same as the singleton pattern. And for now, let's skip the options and let's say export const auth is equal to and then get auth and we pass in the Firebase application and then we can get access to the Google provider. So we can say export const Google auth provider and then new Google auth provider and we import this from add Firebase slash auth instead. And then we can see export function sign in with Google. And we can say return and then sign in with pop up. And we can pass in this auth and then we pass in the Google auth provider. So Firebase knows what provider to use. If you wanted to use, say, Facebook's provider, you'd pass in the Facebook provider instead. So you could have another function, export function, sign in with Facebook and any other provider that you enable. Now, I like to be explicit in return types or in types in general. So what I would like to do is state the return type explicitly. So I'm going to say return type and then type of and sign in with pop up. That way, if for some reason we modify this function, we at least guarantee that we must return sign in with pop up. Now, as for the configuration, we need to pass into environment variables. So for that, we can say API key and then env, we import this and then Firebase API key and then the same for the auth domain. And for this, we can come here to env and we can say for the server 
or actually this is for the client. So must be prefixed with next public. So we can say next public and then pass in this and do the same with the auth domain. And now we can say next auth or next public our base API key and next public auth domain. And we can add this to here. So auth domain from process.env and the same for the API key. And with this, we're good to go now. Now we're getting an error here, seems to be Slint again, so restart Slint server. So as we can see, the error went away. So now with this, we can come here to the end file and add these variables. So I'll copy this and then I'll copy this one as well. And in fact, I'll add a comment here saying Firebase. And if you recall, you can access these keys from this. So you can come here over to project settings and then you can just copy them. So we have the auth domain. So this one, in my case, obviously don't use the ones that I'm using here. I'm going to change them once the video is over. And then the API key. So now let's move on and implement the basic logic for signing in with Google. So for that, we can come here to up and then let's do everything here in the page.csx. So we, in fact, I'll come here to components and I'll create one sign in button and then I'll say sign in button and I'll say export con sign in button react.fc and we're going to have an asynchronous function handle sign in. This will not return anything, so void. And we're going to say return button, then type is equal to button. Let's add some basic classes so it doesn't look that bad. So bg indigo 500, text wide, rounded, and the shadow. And then on click, we pass in handle sign in and we say sign in. And then I can re export this. So I create an index file, export all from sign in button. That way we do not get nested paths. And then I'll get rid of everything here. And we can just have this main, nothing else. Let's get rid of this query and the no store. We're not going to SSR anything right now. And then we can say, sign in button. And let's see if this works. I like to have this as const react.fc. And then we just export default home. Now if I run this, so I'm going to reload the server since we added some environment variables. If I come here, we get an error for the onclick because I forgot the sign in button should be a client component since it has interactivity. So now we have this beautiful sign in button. Now what we can do is add the logic for signing in with the pop up. So we can say try and then catch error. This will be unknown. And for now, we can just say console.error and we pass in the error. So not the best handling of errors but it works for this demonstration. Now we need to get the user credentials. And that is once the user has signed in with Google. So we can say const user credentials is equal to await. And then we import the function that we created. So sign in with Google. This is going to open up the pop up and the user can sign in and we get the user credentials here. And then we can get the access token so that we can send it over to our server. So we can say const access token is equal to await, then user credentials dot user. And I believe this is not nullable, so no need for the optional chaining. And we get the get ID token. So this will be the access token we're going to send over to the server. So we can log this for now and see if it works. So now if I open this up and then click sign in, as we can see, we get this pop up successfully. Now if I sign in with Google, so let me before doing that inspect element and come here to the console and then open up this pop up and then enter my password and then click next. 
as we can see, we get the access token in the console. So now we have successfully authenticated. All we need to do is send this over to the server. The server gets hold of this access token, validates it against the Firebase service, and then it creates the session cookie. Now we can create the login mutation. So we can come here to routers and we can create one for auth. And then within auth, we can have the auth router.ts and then export const auth router is equal to create trpc router. And then we can have the procedures and then we can say login and then public procedure. So anyone can access this. We can say input and we can in fact pass this not via the headers, but via the body of the request. Now you could use whichever you want, but since we're using TRPC, I think it's best to just have it as it is with the body. So we can say access token is a string. I'm not sure in what format it comes or the length of this. So I'm going to make it very general and just say this will be a string. And then we can say mutation and then we get access to the a callback function. And with this callback function, we can get the input and the context for the database. Now, what I like to do is create a service. I don't like to mix up the controller, so the router with your service. So for that, I'm going to say auth service.cs. And then I can export const auth service, and this will be an object. And then we can have the login. So a sync, we get access to the access token, which will be a string. And in fact, this can be a regular function like this. And then we can import the auth service and pass in that input. So await auth service dot login and we pass in the access token. So what happens when we successfully log in? Well, we return the user information. So for that, we can come here to API and then create a directory called repositories. And within this, we're going to have the user repository file. And then we can see export const user repository and then async get user by ID. ID will be user. So we import that from the generated type. So in fact, I'll export a type, type user. And then with this, we can import type. And I'm not sure why it's not picking it up. Easily code gen. So it's users, right? Because it's plural, the database, not singular. So we can say export type user. And then we would return the email. So users add email. And then we would also have the ID. So users at ID and the name. So users at name and then the image. So image URL is users at image URL. So the ID would actually be user at ID. And this will return a promise of a user. And then here we can say return or the B. So we say users or select from and then users. And then we can say where the ID is equal to the ID that we pass in. And then we can say execute take first. Now this will return. Let's see the type of this result will be an empty object or undefined. And that's because we're not selecting anything. So we can come here and we can say dot select. And then we can pass in the ID, name, email, and the image URL. And this is in fact an array. So now as we can see, the result is this or undefined. So now we can say return result or found user or actually user query. And if this doesn't exist, then we can use the knowledge quality single operator saying if this doesn't exist, then null and we can say or null. Okay, so there are a couple of steps we need to take into account. So first of all, verify the access token. 
Then second, get the user info from our database. So synchronize the data from the access token to our database. Then we need to create the session token with Firebase. Then four, set the session token as an HTTP only cookie. And finally, return the user info. So these are all of the steps. But before we can actually verify the access token, we need to set up the Firebase admin SDK. So for that, we can come here and say pmpm add and then Firebase admin. So dash admin. And once this is done, we can now come here to the server and create the Firebase admin module. And we can say import all as admin from Firebase admin and then admin dot initialize application and we pass in the credentials and then we can export it again. So here we can pass in the project ID and this is actually not an object. This is admin dot credential dot cert and then we can say project ID env dot Firebase project ID then we need the client email and then the private key. And in fact, for this one, we need to replace all of the new lines and then we can copy each one. These are server environment variables because they are the ones that are going to validate the access token. So please do not add them in the client. So this is a string, then the client email and then the private key so a string and we can do the same here so we should better organize this but we can leave that for later on so now with this what we need to do is add them here so we have our base public and let's have the our base private so the admin sdk and then i'll copy this i'll copy this one as well and the private key. Now, if you recall, you downloaded a file and that file has all of this information. So now we can copy them here. So we have the project ID, which is this one. Next, we have the client email. So I believe that's down here. So this one. And we also have the private key. So we can copy all of this and paste it here. So now with this, we can restart the dev server and they are now going to be loaded. So we get no errors here. So everything is okay. Now we can come back to the auth service and let's verify the access token. So we can say const verified token is equal to await admin. We import that from the module we created then dot auth and then dot verify ID token and we pass in the access token. So now this will throw an error if the access token is invalid. So for that, we can wrap this up in a try catch and we can say catch error type unknown. And then if error instance of error, that means that the access token is invalid. So we can throw new and then trpc error and we can say code unauthenticated, which is actually unauthorized. Now we can get the user info from our database. So synchronize the data to our database. So for this, we can come here to the user repository and we can observe the user. That means that if the user doesn't exist, we create it. Otherwise, we update some information. So to achieve that, what we can do is say a sync, then absurd user, then we must pass in the email. So user at email. So we know what user to update or the email to create it with. Then we can say data. And here we can pass in two conditions. So we can say on create. We want uh, the name, the image URL and the email. And in the case that we want to update it, 
we just want the name and the image URL, nothing else. So now we can say promise and this will and this will return user or null and then open up the body and this is an or. So in Kisali to do that we can say const result is equal to the b dot insert into then we can say users then dot values then in this case this is for creating a user so we can spread over the data dot on create or in fact we can be a bit more safe here now we know that with typescript we must pass in the name image url and email but typescript is just for the compilation if you pass in the email and we spread over this, we might override the email. Now this is for creating, so it doesn't really matter, but we can be more safe by explicitly targeting the properties. So we can say the name will be data.onCreate.name. Then we can do the same with email, then the image URL. Now here, Kisali doesn't support Absurds per se, like you would with Prisma, where you can say absurd. Since this is a query builder and it is very close to actually SQL, you know that with SQL you can say on conflict and then you can say which constraint or what failed and in that case what you want to update. So for that we can do pretty much the same and we can say on conflict and then we say on conflict we get this parameter and we can say here just oc and dot and then column so on which conflict in this case on the column email if it already exists and then we can say do update set and then we can say name will be data dot an update dot name and the image url and then we can say returning and we pass in an array and then execute take first and then we can return from this result or null now we're getting an error here saying is missing the following properties the id and updated ad so for the updated ad we can just say new date and call it a day like this because it does really matter here in the migration we have this trigger and this will just replace whatever value we pass in here so it doesn't matter that we set it to new date but there is a problem and that is the id now prisma even though we told it to use a uid for default as we can see there is no default uid here so it is actually required that's why we're getting this error so to fix this what you need to do is come here to the schema.prisma and modify this to have this at default then db generated and then you can pass in a function and this gen random uid exists by default in postgresql so since this is a procedure we invoke it here now as the documentation states this is not validated by Prisma. That's why we can pass in an arbitrary value. Now I believe if you can do this, then you can even create your own function. Maybe you have some unique logic for regenerating something, then that could be targeted here. And then I add this directive, so at the b.uid. Now if you delete the migrations and then create one by saying Prisma migrate dev, you pass in the name, then create only, and then you come here. Now, if you scroll to the top, you will see that we have now the default and then gen random UID. So this is what it is going to use. So DB generated. And then I added the update function and the trigger as we had before. So with this, now if we say Prisma migrate dev and we apply this, as we can see it now works and now we can say db cogen so pmpm run db cogen and if i come back here then restart slint and typescript as well just to make sure that everything is completely synchronized and if i come here to the user type as we can see the id now has this generated wrapper generic so now kisali knows that it is not required and so we can now use this as we want. 
but now we're getting some errors here. So we have this error for ID and we have this error because we're returning something that doesn't match a user. Same with this one. And that's because here we have this generated generic, which again, let's easily note that this is not required because it is generated by the driver. So in this case, by PostgreSQL. So for this, we need to get rid of that generic. We only care about the base type, the string. That's why when we say users at ID, this is actually the column itself. So all of this rather than the type itself. And so by doing this, when you actually query something, the type is the base type, not that column type we just saw. So for that, we can use this selectable helper. So we can say selectable and then we can target users. So this is going to strip all of that and we get the base types and then we can access the ID and now the errors went away. So as we can see, we now have successfully created this app search user. So now we can come here to the auth service and we can say const user info is equal to user repository, app search user, then verify token dot email, which can be undefined, but it isn't. The reason it can be undefined is because if you allow signing up with a phone number, then there is no email. But in our case, we know there is going to be an email because this is going to be via the provider. But we can be safe and we can say if verify token dot email is equal to undefined, then we can just throw new error, no email in the access token. And in fact, this will be caught by this. So this is true because the access token is invalid because we would never want an undefined email which is not going to happen, but to make TypeScript happy and to make our code base safer, we're going to do this validation either way. And then we can say on create, and we want to add the email. So this one, and we want to add the image URL, which is the picture. Now I believe this can be undefined. So we can just say or null. And what about the name? Now there might not be a name. So in that case, I'm not sure if this has a type. I think this is any, as we can see here. So we can say type of verified token that name is equal to a string. If so, take that or just say null. And then on update, we just pass in the image URL and we do the same with the name. Now we can, in fact, say name is equal to this. That way we do not do code duplication. Now I forgot another important step before creating the session token, and that is setting the custom claims. And that is so whenever we do a request, we know to whom that session token belongs to. Because if you check this out, so verify token that we have the email. So this could work. But what about the ID in our database? We have this UID. But this is not for our database. This is in fact for Firebase. So for that, what we can do is just say await, then admin auth, then set custom user claims. We pass in the verified token dot UID, and then we can pass in the custom user claims. So we can say X. So I like to prefix it with X similar to how you do cookies like X something. So here I would say X and then user ID. And then we pass in the user info dot ID, which is not returning. Ah, uh, this is not awaited. So await, and this is possibly null. So in that case, we can say if user info is equal to null, then fail to synchronize the user info. And then we can pass in X user email as well. And with this, we can now create the session token. So we can say con session token, create session cookie. We pass in the access token that comes with these custom user claims. And then we can pass in some extra information such as when it should expire. In this case, we're telling it to expire in five days. That means that when five days pass, the session cookie will be invalid. 
so the user will need to log in again. Now, this is too short. I would recommend something like two weeks. That's a good middle ground. Anyway, you can configure this however you want. Now let's move on to the fourth one. Set the session token as an HTTP only cookie. Now there's a problem. If I come here over to the auth router, when we access the context, we can only access headers or well the database, but there is no way for us to set an HTTP only cookie. So we need to get access to that response object. So for that, what we can do is come here to the trpc file where we create the trpc context and then we can say we need the request. So next request and the response, next response. And then we can pass them here. Well, this is being spread over, so we do not need to assign them manually. Now here we just define the types, but we're not actually passing in the request or the response. So for that, we need to come here to app and then come here to the API directory and then to the route for trpc. And as you can see, we get this error because we need to pass in the response. So we can say request here and then we need to say response and then response here or next response actually. And then we can say rest here. But this is the actual handler. This is just creating the context. So we export this as get and as a post. So we can say this handler also receives the next response. And then we can pass it here to this function. And now with this, we can access the request and the response. But there's a problem though. And that is React server components. If we access the response in the auth router, so we say context dot request or response dot cookies dot set, this is not going to work if you invoke this procedure in a React server component. And the reason is because Next.js for some reason doesn't give you the request nor the response objects in a server component. So what I mean by this is if I say, API and then we say dot post dot and then hello and then query and then we pass in something so text hello and we await this. This is not going to get that request and response object and we can in fact confirm this if I come here to trpc this directory right next to the server and then open up this server file, we have this create context and this is for the React server component. And this logic right here is simply a way to invoke the procedures without using HTTP requests. Since server components always run on the server, we can just call the procedure as a function. So instead of the server making a request to its own server, we can just come here and invoke a procedure that's it. We do not need to do a request and add that extra latency. So that's why they use this observable so that we can just call the procedure. So if you take a look at the create context, they are caching this function and all they do is get the headers by using the headers function. So in server components, you can only access the headers and the cookies like this. But unfortunately, you cannot set an HTTP only cookie with this cookies function. So that's why they just do headers and they pass in the headers, but we cannot pass in the request nor the response. So what can we do in that case? Well, in that case, the solution is simple. What I would do is come here to the trpc file once again, and then export type, and then trpc context, and then we say awaited, return type because this is asynchronous, although we can get rid of async here, but it's useful if you need to add some asynchronous logic here. And then you could come here and return an object that satisfies this trpc context. And then you get autocomplete. So you know that you must pass in the request, headers, response, and db. But we can say partial so that they are not all required, but you still get that autocomplete. So you can say DB and then you import the DB client from Kisily. Then you can say headers is the heads and you do not pass in anything to the request nor the response. So now we can get rid of this import and we're getting an error here because this is no longer asynchronous. So we can say const context is equal to create context. We invoke this 
we get that context as we can see here. And then all we need to do is say call procedure. We pass in these properties, we pass in the context. And here we can get rid of all of this logic and of these extra parentheses. And with this, now the errors went away, but it is not entirely type safe. Because if you try invoking a procedure that requires the request and response objects in a server component, then it is not going to work as they will be undefined. So the catch is all you need to do is make sure not to invoke a procedure that requires the request and response objects in a server component. That's the workaround. In fact, everyone has complained about this limitation since the time being, but they have not said anything about it. And in fact, they argue that it is a design choice, which is absolutely ridiculous as pretty much every server side framework in existence allows you to access the request and response, even the traditional ones like those in Java. So until they resolve that or come up with a different solution, this is the workaround for now. So again, make sure not to invoke a procedure that requires the request and response in a server component and you're good to go. So let's confirm this. Let's come here to the hello endpoint and then let's get access to the context and let's say log then hello context and then we say context and then if I save this and then open up the terminal and then we hit this component, as we can see, we get the context to be database and headers. And that's it. We do not get access to the request nor the response. But if we invoke this in a server or in a client component instead, so sign in button, we know that this uses client, and then we say API, and we import this from React, not from server, and then we say post dot hello dot use query and then we pass in something so we input hello or text world and then if we save this and then open this up once again as we can see we now get so we have post dot hello and then we have the headers so the same as the server one we get access to the request and we get access to the response and then we have the database so let's now proceed to setting the cookie. So for that, we can go back to our auth router. And here we need to access the session cookie. So let's come here, log in, we verify the access token, we synchronize it to the database, we set the custom claims, and we created the session token. So what I'm going to do is just say return session token and user information. And let's actually do better error handling. So let's say if error instance of and then trpc error, we just rethrow that error. And if not, we just throw new trpc error, internal server error and fail to login. And here we can replace these errors with just throw new trpc error and then unauthorized the access token is invalid and we can do the same here. So failed to log in. Now you would have a logger here so that you can later on trace back and see what happened, but let's keep it simple. And with this, we can now come here and destructure this, get the session token and the user information. Now, before we move on, we actually need to configure some things. And that is I tried setting the HTTP only cookie and it wasn't working. It wasn't setting the cookie at all. So what are the changes? Well, first of all, come here to the TRPC file and get rid of the response. We're only going to have the request itself and we're also going to have the headers. Now, after you do this change, you then need to come here over to TRPC and then react.tsx. And here, previously, you should have one that says unstable HTTP batch stream link. Get rid of that and replace it with this one, HTTP batch link from at trpc slash client. And then you can pass in the URL, which I believe is pretty much the same as it was before. So do that a change. 
And the reason is because when you use that stream, Next.js does not allow you to set headers, so you cannot set a cookie. So after you have done that, you now need to come here over to the route, so over to API, then TRPC, then the dynamic path for TRPC, and then the route. And within this, you're going to accept instead of the response, the response headers which is of type headers, and then you pass that to the context. And then you can come here to this create context where we invoke the create context and you take in the response headers. So here we have the request and the response headers. So take that and pass it to this function as I told you. So after you have done all of those changes, make sure to come here over to Firebase Admin the admin application we created, which is for the server only. And then you're going to add this check. If admin.applications.length is equal to zero, then initialize the application. Otherwise, do not do anything else. That way, we can also achieve the same singleton we did for the client. So it is not going to try and create multiple applications every time we use this. Now we can finish this. So let's come here over to the login method in the auth service and let's extract the expire scene. So const expire scene and I'll let Copilot do the job. And then we just point to this variable and then we return expire scene. That way we can now come here and the structure expire scene as well. And then we can set the cookie so we can target the headers. So the response headers we passed through, then we can say set, then we say set cookie, and then we say the name of the cookie. So key value per, so this is the key, session underscore token, and then we pass in the session token, and then we use this delimiter. So semicolon, then HTTP only, and this is so you cannot access it with JavaScript, and then semicolon again, then you pass in the path, so the root, so that you can access the cookie everywhere in your application. So basically for your whole domain, then semicolon, then same site is equal to Lux. This is just extra security. So you can only set it through your domain, then semicolon and secure, which in fact, we need to make a small change here. And then expires is equal to and then new date, we pass in date.now plus expire scene, and then to UTC string. That way we reuse this expire scene, so both the cookie and the actual session token in Firebase have the same expiration. Now I told you we need to change this up, and that is because Secure tells this cookie to only be accessed via HTTPS. So if we set this right now, since we're going to be developing in HTTP and not HTTPS, then we cannot set the cookie at all. So for that, we can say const secure is equal to env and then node env is equal to production. And if it is, then we can say secure, then semicolon, otherwise just an empty string. And then we can say here secure. So now we have successfully finished the login endpoint. So let's try it out. So we can now come here over to the root of the app router. So app router root under API, which is under the server directory. And then we can say auth is auth router. And then we can come here to the sign in button and we can say const login mutation is equal to API. And we import this from React and then dot auth dot login dot use mutation. And then here, instead of logging this, we can just say void login mutation dot mutate async and we pass in the access token. And then here, in fact, we can say login mutation that is loading. If it is, then say loading, otherwise sign in with Google. And if we save this file and then come back here and then inspect element and go over to the application tab. So this one, as we can see, there are no cookies at all. But if I click on sign in with Google, and then it is going to perform the mutation. And then as we can see, we have the session token. So this one and this one comes from Firebase. And if I expand this, as we can see, we have the value, the domain. So it was set by localhost. 
then the path expires in or at, and we have this date, and then we have this size, it is HTTP only, then it isn't secure because, well, this is not HTTPS, this is not in production. And so as we can see, this is successfully added. And if we refresh the page, as we can see, we still have the session token. So now we can move on to adding the middleware in TRPC. So we can come here and open the TRPC file and scroll down to the bottom where we have this public procedure. And here we can say export const protected procedure is equal to t dot procedure. And then we can say dot use. So this is the middleware. And then async, we get the options. And this is a function that we can invoke. And the idea is that you return options dot next. So you invoke the query or the mutation that comes next, and you can pass in some context. So you can say context is, and then options.context. But here, since we're going to pass the user information, we can say options.context, and then the user. But we need to validate the user first. So here we can say const session cookie or token is equal to options.context dot headers dot get so from the request and then session token and this if we take a look at this is a string or a null so if session token is equal to null then we can throw a new trpc error here and we can say unauthorized you must be logged in to perform this action and then we can say try and then catch an error so unknown and then we can say const decoded claims await admin. So we import this from at server for base admin. And then we can say auth and then verify session cookie. And then here we can say return. So from this, so we can say return. And then we can pass in the user information. And then here we can say id is decoded claims.x user id and decoded claims.x user email. So respectively, and we must await this. Now I'm getting an error here saying unsafe assignment of the any value. So for that, we can use a class guard if decoded claims dot x user ID is different from undefined. And if this is equal to undefined, we just throw a TRPC error. And here we can check if error instance of TRPC error, then we just rethrow that error. Otherwise, just unauthorized and here actually in this case we can just say internal server error and then something went wrong and here we can check if instance of error if it is then the session token is invalid because i believe this will throw an error if it's invalid so it says a rejected promise otherwise now another error because this is still any so we can say as a string and as a string here and with this, we have successfully created our protected procedure. So anyone who tries to access a mutation or a query that uses this protected procedure must be authenticated. And actually here, now that I think about it, this is wrong. Because if at this point there is no X user ID nor X user email, then that means that something went wrong on our end on setting these custom claims. So we should say internal server error. And here we can say fail to verify session token. But realistically speaking, you would have a logger here. So again, you can see what went wrong and why this unexpected behavior occurred. So now with this, we can come back here to the auth router and have the me endpoint. So me, then private procedure or protected procedure. Then we can say dot query. So no input whatsoever, because that comes in the cookies and we know the user must be authenticated. We can just come here to the auth service and create another function. And in fact, I like to keep things explicit. So this should return a session token, a user information. So this is actually user. We import this from the repository user repository and expire scene, which is a number. And this is in fact a promise. 
This way, if you ever accidentally get rid of something here, well, this is already checking it for you. So you do not make any mistakes. And so with this, we can say get user info, then ID at user at ID. And then this returns the user or null. Realistically speaking, it shouldn't be null, but we must be explicit and then just return user repository, get user by ID, and we pass in that ID. And then here in the controller, we can say const user info is equal to await auth service dot get user info, and we pass in the context dot user dot ID. So as we can see, everything is fully type safe because here in the protected procedure, we're passing the user information and it knows it contains ID and email. So by saying next, well, with the power TypeScript, it can infer that the context with a protected procedure contains the user object. So this is very powerful. And then here you could say, if user info is equal to null, then throw new trpc error. And here you would say internal server error because that shouldn't happen. There should be a synchronized user. So again, you'd have a logger here. And I emphasize this a lot because you should monitor everything so that if an error occurs, you can know what happened and help you debug. If you just let this slip through, it will become much harder to know where it went wrong. And so here we can say return user info. And that's pretty much it. So actually, before we test it out, I forgot once again here, if we come to the trpc file, and if I scroll down, we have the context.headers.get, but the headers do not contain the cookies. So this is always going to fail. So for this, we need to say session token is equal to cookies. We invoke this from next.js. So we import this function from next slash headers. And this is going to give us this utility where we can access the cookies, but we cannot set cookies. That's important. But in this case, we only need to read this cookie. So we can say cookies.get and then we pass in session token. And with this change, we can now validate this to be undefined instead of null. And then instead, we can say get value. So session token dot value, which is a string. So we can say session token dot value. And now we can test it out. So if I come here to the root page, for example, and say const me is equal to await API, we import this from trpc server, then auth dot me, and then query. And so now we can say code, and then JSON dot stringify me. And if I save this, and then come back here, as we can see, we get all of this information right away. So that's because the user is authenticated. But you wouldn't usually have this in a server component. We can extract this, get rid of this, come here to the sign in button, and then const me query api.auth.me.use query. And then we can say here disable if me.query the data is different from undefined and if the me query is loading, so we can say me query that is loading or is fetching. And then we can say disabled and we pass in opacity 50. So we get that feedback. And then we can say here, so we can have a react fragment and we can say if me query dot data and here it is, is different from undefined, then we can render a code and we stringify this. So now if I save this, come back here, as we can see, we cannot click on this. And that's because we're already signed in, but we do get the data here. So if I refresh, it is loading. Now let's quickly implement the logout. So for that, we can come here to the auth router and then log out and then protected procedure. And all we need to do here is say await auth service dot logout. And we need to pass in the session cookie. So for that, we can come here to trpc and here just pass in the session token. And then by doing this, we can actually pass in the session token or in fact, I think we should have this under user. 
So these should actually be session instead of user. So session token here, and then we need to change this. So session ID, and then session dot token. And in the auth service, we can say log out and then return admin dot auth and then revoke refresh tokens. And we pass in the session token and then we can come back here and say try catch error unknown. We would log this here and then throw new CRPC error and then internal server error fail to log out. And we also need to get rid of the cookie. So we can say context dot request dot cookies dot delete and we pass in session token and we should also have a logger. So here you would have something went wrong and you pass in the name. So log out. This is the procedure. And then you could say fail to log out and you pass in error. So now let's try it out. Let's come here to the page, then sign in button. And let's actually have everything here. So const logout mutation, logout use mutation, and then we could have a button here. So type button on click, we mutate, and then this is disabled if it is loading or if the mequery dot data is equal to undefined. And actually that makes sense. I was doing that. I did not check the code generated by Copilot. That is never true because we're checking that it's different from undefined. And so if I save this, as we can see, we get the sign out button because we are in fact logged in. Now, if you actually tried signing out, it's not going to work. And the reason is because if I check the output, we get fail to log out for base auth error. The UID must be a non empty string with at most 128 characters. And the reason is because it is actually not taking in the token because it is not going to revoke a single token, but rather it is going to revoke all of the tokens from a particular user. So you need to pass in that UID. So for that, we can come here to TRPC and then we can say UID is decoded claims dot UID. And then we can pass that in instead. And if I save this and then come back here, click sign out, as we can see loading. And then let's see if that works. Let's see. And that's not going to work because well, this is for the request and not for the response. So since you cannot access the response, what we have to do is we have to use a workaround. And instead, we must say here context dot headers dot set, then we say set cookie, then session token is an empty token, and then expires add basically in the past. So the browser will delete this cookie since well, it has already expired. And by doing this, we effectively remove that cookie. So another limitation on Next.js. So by doing this, if I save this and then come here to the application tab, click sign out, as we can see, the cookie no longer exists. Now, if we try signing out once again, so network and then sign out, this is going to fail. And why? Because unauthorized, you must be logged in to perform this action. If I refresh this, as we can see, we now need to sign in. Now we get another error, auth.me, you must be logged in to perform this action. Now we can sign in once again and repeat the process. Now, as you can see, it is retrying three times until the default of three retries have already occurred. And then it allows you to click on the button. So to avoid that behavior, what you can do is to provide this retry. So this is for the variable. So you say undefined because it doesn't take anything. And then you pass in all of these options and then you can pass in the retry callback. And in this retry, you get access to the failure count to so how many times it has failed and then the error. So this is going to be executed every time it fails. So you get the failure count and you can say if error instance of TRPC client error, then check the status code. Is it for one? So unauthorized, then 
do not retry because we're not going to retry if the user is not signed in. Otherwise, we just return failure count less than two. And by doing that, if I refresh, as you can see, the error goes away immediately. And again, if I change this to be five, for example, as we can see, it is retrying many times. So we have one, two, three, and then four, and then the fifth one. So for that, you can say this. And in fact, you can configure this globally. I'm pretty sure maybe here in React, you can pass in the configuration for the client, but I'm not entirely sure you'd have to consult the documentation for that. So here where we have the query client, I believe you can pass in an object and then default options. And here you have for the queries and then retry. And here you get a failure count and error. And you just do this check that way. Everything already does this. And so with any query, you can ensure that it is not going to retry if the user is not authenticated. Now, in fact, you can assert this to not get that error that HTTP status does not exist. So all you need to do is say TRPC error is equal to error as TRPC client error. And then you use an intersection and you pass in the object to intersect with HTTP status of type number. And that way we can at the very least assert at the type level that it does contain HTTP status. I'm not entirely sure why it is not the default in the type definition for the TRPC client error. Okay, so I made some changes and they made the authentication more robust. I didn't want to extend this video too much, so I decided to develop this in my own time. But remember, you can find the repository in the description. And if you want, you can just clone the repository and use that for your own application. But I really recommend watching this part so that you understand how everything works. So what I did was integrate Redis and Redis is an in-memory cache. So it's similar to a database, but instead of writing to disk, meaning that the data should persist indefinitely, Redis is for caching data or that short-lived data. So Redis is a perfect candidate for session token management. So remember that I told you that you cannot invalidate sessions using Firebase because they simply do not support that. Well, for that, I simply got rid of Firebase for the server and managed the session token myself. So for that, I made some changes, particularly in the user repository and the auth service. So let's take a look at the auth service first. Well, for these, we have two cookies. We have the session token cookie and we have the user ID stored in the same secure cookie. The reason we do this is because in Redis, the key is the user ID and the value is a set of session tokens that allows you to invalidate all session tokens. So for example, you have a button and says log out from all devices. Well, for that, you can just go to Redis and delete all of the values in that set. And now you have invalidated all connected devices. So that's why I created it with a set. So what I mean by this is if I take a look at my Redis instance, as we can see, we have the sorted set and the key is session tokens. So that's the prefix. And then we have the actual user ID. So one of the cookies we set is the user ID. That way, when with every request we send over the session token, it is going to send over that user ID so we can look up in Redis for the session tokens pertaining to this user. And here we have the members. So for example, here I've only logged in with one device. So we have the session token and this is hashed. And then we have a score. So I'm using a sorted set so that we can expire sessions that are no longer valid. So in Redis, we use this score to calculate where these members should reside. So let's take a look at the code. So I have this get sessions tokens key. So this is simply going to give me the session token with a prefix. So we pass in the user ID. We can take this user ID, pass it in, and this function will return this whole concatenated string. Then we have this add user session. We pass in the user ID. We pass in the session token we generated. We pass in the expire scene. And all we do here is get the key. So we generate the key. 
then we calculate the score. So it is simply going to be date.now and we add the expired time in seconds. And then we can say await redis, then sort it set, and we pass in that session key, which is going to be the key. Then we pass in the score, and then we pass in the value, which is the actual session token. And then we can say await redis.expire, and we say for the whole set to be this expire scene. So every time you add a user session, it is going to update the expire. So as long as the user is actively using your application, all of these session tokens will be valid. Then we have this delete session token. All we do is simply get the key. So again, with the prefix, and then we remove that member from the sorted set, as simple as that. We then have this get session token function. Now, this is where the logic for invalidating the session token is. So all we do is simply get the score. So we look up that source that set, we extract that score from that particular session token, and then we get the current timestamp. So all we do here is simply check if the time has expired. If it hasn't, then token is valid and not expired. But if it has, then here at this point, either the token is not found or expired. And if so, we remove it from the set. So that way you could have a stale session tokens stored in your Redis instance. But when someone actually tries to use them, we have this safeguard that is going to check for the validity of that session token. Now here I would recommend setting up maybe a limit for session tokens. So a maximum of 20 session tokens here in the add user session. That way, if someone logs in into multiple devices, you can ensure that they are not going to explode your Redis memory with a lot of unused session tokens. Okay, so then we have the actual logic for generating the session token. So we create the row token, which is simply the user ID, the date.now and math.random. And here we hash this string with argon2. And I believe this is going to salt it automatically behind the scenes, but I'm not entirely sure. And then we return that hash token. Now, as for the service itself, we have this helper function create secure cookie. So this is a way so that we can pass in the parameters, we can say expire scene, name and value, and it is going to handle the creation automatically for us. And we need this function to reuse the logic for creating the user ID cookie, because these two are essentially the same security wise. And then we have the delete cookie. So pretty self explanatory, we have the login method, which we had previously. And in fact, all of this is the same. The only thing that changes is this part right here, where we generate the session token manually. So instead of calling Firebase, we call this function, and then we add the user session, we pass in the session token expire scene, and the ID of the user. So this is going to add it to our Redis memory. And then we create the secure cookies for both the session token and the user ID. And we just return the user info. So now everything is handled by the auth service. If I come here to the controller, which is the router, as we can see, we just invoke this method and we pass in the parameters, nothing fancy. And then we have the logout. So this is going to delete the session token in Redis and it is going to remove the cookies. So pretty basic. And here for the logout, as we can see, we have a wait of service that logout and we pass in the parameters. And in fact, I just noticed that we are still invoking this too. So this method, all it does is simply log out the user, nothing more. Then we have validate session token. And this one is used for the middleware for the protected procedure middleware. So here, if I come to the protected procedure, as we can see, we get the cookies. So we get the encoded session token, we get the user ID, and we check that these two exist. If either one of them does not exist, we throw an error saying unauthorized. And then here we have the call to validate session token. So we pass in the encoded session token, and we pass in the user ID. Again, this is useful so that we can search for session tokens 
we pass in that user ID here, and then we can validate the session token in the source that's set. So here, we simply decode the session token, we check if it exists, so we get the session token, and if it doesn't exist, so it is not within this Redis source that said, then we know it is not valid, and so we return false. Otherwise, we return success true, and then we return the user info. So we call our database, get that user information, and we also pass in the session token. And this is important so that in our context, we can access the user information. So here we have the context, we spread over the existing context, and then we pass in the session, and the session contains email, the ID of the user, image URL, and name, and well, the session token if we ever need it. So now you might be wondering, hey, does that mean that you're calling or reading from the database every single time for every single request? And the answer is no, because I told you that we're now caching everything so that it is faster to retrieve, and also we do not explode our database with unnecessary reads, lowering the cost of the database. So if I come here to the user repository, as we can see, we're caching everything with Redis. So here we have this method, cache user info, we pass in the user ID, and we pass in the user information that we want to cache in. And then we simply set to Redis the user key, so the ID of the user, and then we stringify the user information that we want to cache. So if I come here to Redis, as we can see, I have already cached the user. So we have user info, we have the ID of this particular user, and then we have the JSON data of this user. So that's pretty much it. Now, one of the implications of using a cache is that you need to make sure to synchronize the real data with your cache so that you do not get a stale data in the cache. For example, if you want to get a user by ID, then we check if it is cached. If it is cached, then we just return the cache to user information. If it isn't, we perform a query to our database and then we cache the data and we return the user information right away. But when we observe a user or when you want to update a user or do something that modifies the user table, you need to synchronize that information with the cache. So here we have observe user. So we create or update if the user doesn't exist. And all we do is say, once all of this transaction has finished, then we cache the user info. So here we're synchronizing the data with the cache, and then we return the data we query from the database. So again, if you have an update, after you update it, you need to call this cache user info once again. Now, if you're following the repository pattern, this should be pretty seamless as you will handle everything within the service. If you weren't using the user repository, good luck synchronizing the cache data. It would be a huge mess. So bonus points to the repository pattern. So let me show you a demo again of how everything works. So if I refresh, I'm not logged in. And if I click on sign in with Google, then I sign in, I get loading, I get the data shown here. And if I refresh, as we can see, the data loads, and I also have these two cookies. But here's something interesting. If you take a look at the layout, when I refresh, there is no query for the user information, nowhere to be seen. How did I achieve that? Well, I achieved this thanks to the power of server components. So let's take a look at that. So if I come here to the root page, I have this function, so get me, and all I do is return await api.author.me and then query. So again, React Server component, we import API from a TRPC server. And if there is an error, so if the user is not authenticated, all I do is return null, nothing more. And then I use unstable no store. So this is going to enable that SSR, server side rendering, so that it is not going to cache this data because, well, this is going to be for every single user, not a landing page where you want to cache the data. And then I say const user equals await get me. And then I have this component, which is a client component called user store initializer. And if I come here, it is not actually a React component because it is not rendering anything. 
But what we do here is use a ref, and this is used to see if the server has already initialized the store or not. So in this case, if it hasn't been initialized, then we set it to true, and then we use session from sustand, and then we say set state, and we pass in the data to be this user. So user can be user or null, because if the user isn't authenticated, then it is going to be null. And then if I come here to use session, we have this basic substance store. So initially it is null and status unauthenticated. And then we have update, we just take in data, which is user or null. And if it is different from null, then the status is authenticated, otherwise unauthenticated. And well, we pass in the data. So that way in client components, so if I come here over to the auth screen, which was the sign in button we had, we can say use session, and then we can access the data in a client component. And this is very important. Please do not try accessing the data in a server component, because you will end up leaking sensitive information to other users which is not what you want. And so we have the login mutation, logout mutation. So when you log in, we just update the data with the data we get back from the server. So again, auth router, we have the login, we return this, which returns a promise of a user. So we take in that data, which is a user, and we update the session accordingly. And as for the logout, we just set it to null, as the user is no longer logged in. And then handle sign in, this is all pretty much the same. And then we have the buttons for logging in and signing out. So if I come here and check my Redis instance, as we can see, we have two tokens. If I sign out, now I'm no longer signed in. And as we can see, we do not get the information again. And if I click on sign in with Google again, as we can see, we have successfully signed in. And if I come here to the result, we have login. And then the result is data, which is the user information. So as simple as that. And as we can see, if I come here to Redis, we now have two sessions. And if I sign out, then come back here, refresh this, as we can see one session. Now this wraps up the video. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe. Don't forget, you can find the repository in the description. I'll see you in the next one.